So they've been brought in very close to the coast, which allows them to you know, shoot artillery in, but it also makes them vulnerable to silkworm missiles. These are a Chinese-made missile used by the Iraqis with a massive payload, so that one missile is capable of shooting down a large American battleship. So Michael Riley's in the radar room watching out for these silkworm missiles. His job is to make sure none of these missiles are launched, and if they are launched, to shoot them down right away. So that's what he's doing at 5.01 in the morning in the radar room on the second day of the ground invasion, when all of a sudden he sees two neon green blips appear just off the Iraqi coast. And as soon as he sees these two neon green blips, he's convinced that they're silkworm missiles. He's convinced that, that this is what he's been waiting for, this is his big moment. You know, he, it's this tremendous feeling of fear. His, his hands get all clammy and sweaty. Uh, sweat starts to pool above his upper lip. His pulse starts to race. He can feel adrenaline course through his bloodstream. You know, these are silkworm missiles, and they're on path. They're headed straight for the Allied convoy. So as soon as he sees these two neon green blips, he gives the order to prepare his sea darts. Those are his sea-to-air missiles capable of shooting down the silkworm missiles to prepare them to launch so he can fire them at the silkworm missiles. But Mike O'Reilly has a problem. You see, for the last six and a half weeks, he's been watching American A6 fighter jets take off from the aircraft carriers behind him, drop their bombs in Iraq, and then go wet feet. That's a technical term for when they become visible on his naval radar at a very similar spot just off the Iraqi coast because they're just coming back to the aircraft carriers. So on the one hand, he's got this very powerful feeling of fear. On the other hand, he knows that these could also be these two neon blips could also be two American fighter jets. They could just be A6 fighter jets returning home from a mission. So here's his terrible dilemma. He's got 45 seconds to make a decision. On the one hand, he knows if he doesn't fire his sea darts, and those are silkworm missiles, then an American battleship, probably the USS Missouri, is about to be sunk. Hundreds of sailors will die. It'll be the most devastating encounter of the war for the Allies, and he'll have watched it all happen. On the other hand, if he fires his sea darts, and those are two A6 fighter jets, and he's about to kill four American pilots. He'll be court-martialed, his career will be over, he's going to have to tell his commanding officer that he shot down these planes because he got nervous, you know, at 5.01 in the morning, which is not a very good excuse. Um, so, so this is his weighty, terrifying dilemma. The 45 seconds are up, and Michael Riley makes his decision. He gives the order to fire. He watches as these sea darts race towards these two neon green blips, Whatever they are, he still has no idea. And then 700 yards in front of the USS Missouri, he watches as his sea darts shoot these two neon blips out of the sky. Right after it's clear that he shot down whatever it is he shot down, his commanding officer runs into the room and says, Lieutenant Commander Riley, how did you know those were silkworm missiles? And Riley's forced to tell his commanding officer that he didn't know, he just knew. He just had this feeling of fear. Needless to say, the next four hours are the longest hours of Michael Riley's life. They send crews out to scour the wreckage floating on the surface of the ocean. They do an inventory of all the A6 fighter jets, trying to determine what the, you know, what the hell Riley shot down. The answer finally comes back four hours later, and it turns out that Michael Riley shot down Silkworm missiles, that he saved the day, that he was a hero, that he saved the USS Missouri from being sunk. Hundreds of sailors were alive because Michael Riley made the right decision at 5.01 in the morning. After the war is over, the British Navy goes back to investigate, trying to figure out how Michael Riley made this decision. And their initial conclusion is that Michael Riley got lucky. That even though he was a hero and he made the right decision and he saved the day, he could have just as easily killed four American pilots. That based on their investigation of the tapes, there was no way to tell those silkworm missiles from A6 fighter jets. He just, he just made the right guess. He fled, he, Flipped a coin, so to speak. So that's the way the case was closed. That's the way the matter rested. Until a few years later when a cognitive psychologist named Gary Klein got involved. Gary Klein is a consultant for the Marine Corps. He's probably best known for his studies of firefighters. You know, firefighters enter a house. They've got these very powerful intuitions about how the fire is going to behave, about how you have to fight the fire. They often can't explain these intuitions, and yet their intuitions often turn out to be right. So Gary Klein studied them, trying to figure out you know, where our intuitions come from how expertise leads to feelings and, and instincts we can't quite explain. So he heard the legend of Michael Riley and gotten interested, and so he got the tapes, and he went back to the tapes. Only unlike the British Navy, he didn't just look at the tapes from that morning. He went back and looked at the tapes from the previous six and a half weeks, trying to find some difference, some subtle discrepancy between the pattern of blips Michael Riley saw 
that morning, on the second day of the ground invasion, and the pattern of blips he'd been watching from the ASIC fighter jets for the previous six weeks. And it took him a few days of just staring at tape after tape after tape, but he eventually found the discrepancy, and the discrepancy was this. That A6 fighter jets, at that point in their journey, when they go wet feet, they're traveling at about 10,000 feet. So they became visible on Michael Riley's naval radar as soon as they hit the water. So within a single sweep of the radar screen, we've all seen you know, the Tom Clancy movies, we know what these radar screens look like. It goes around once, and as soon as it went around, those two neon blips were there right off the coast. Now the Silkworm missiles, they were traveling a little bit lower, 3,000 feet. So There's a touch of ground interference, which meant they didn't become visible until the third sweep of the naval, the third sweep of the radar screen, about three to five seconds later. So even though they were traveling along in the exact same path, Gary Klein noticed that there was this timing delay. And it was that discrepancy, he argued, that led Michael Riley to experience this very intense feeling of fear, this, this profound emotion. And it was that emotion, this, this feeling he couldn't explain, even when pressed by his commanding officer, and, and that even when pressed by the British Navy months later, it was this feeling which led him to give the order to fire his silkworm missiles, fire his sea darts, excuse me. It was, it was this slight sensing of a discrepancy he couldn't even explain, which led to the correct decision. Now, I, I, I love this story for all the obvious reasons. It's you know, suspenseful and, and, and life or death scenarios. It reads like something out of a Tom Clancy novel. But I think it also illustrates something very important about how the brain works and how our emotions work, and how our emotions, even though we've seen them for a long time as these impulsive horses in the mind, these, these, these passionate things, impulses to ignore, that they're often very grounded in reality. In my book, I talk about this in terms of the dopamine system. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter in the brain. It's used by brain cells to communicate. It's a little chemical in the empty space between neurons. And it's, for a long time, had a pretty dodgy reputation. It's been a neurotransmitter associated with sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It's the thing responsible for making us like sex, drugs, and rock and roll so much. And, and you know, to be completely honest, dopamine is still responsible for you know, crack cocaine and, and loud music and, and all sorts of things that especially parents would probably wish didn't exist. Um, but, but in recent years, there's been a reevaluation of dopamine. We've realized that it's not just the chemical of hedonism, but it's also an, a crucial element of cognition, that it helps us perceive patterns in reality and make predictions and make sure our predictions are accurate, that it helps us transform the helter-skelter of the real world into neat chains of causation and correlation. I think some of the most interesting work on dopamine has been done by a guy named Wolfram Schultz. He's a neuroscientist at Cambridge and Caltech. And he first got interested in dopamine because it was associated with hedonism and rewards. So he did these very simple experiments with monkeys where he would give monkeys squirts of apple juice. In case you didn't know, monkeys love apple juice. It's one of their favorite things in the world. And he'd give them these squirts of apple juice while recording from individual dopamine neurons in the monkey brain. And that allowed him to see how they were active. And at first, what he found was what everyone expected to find, which is that you give monkeys a squirt of something they love, a squirt of apple juice, and the dopamine neuron would fire every time you gave it a little bit of apple juice, and then the monkey would get very happy. You know, it just had its sweet reward. And, and that made perfect sense. That's what we expected dopamine to do. It's supposed to track rewards, be it sex or apple juice. And, 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 and so that made perfect sense. But then Schultz found something kind of interesting, which is that if you kept on giving the monkey these squirts of apple juice, before long, the dopamine neurons stopped firing. They got bored by the reward. The monkey was you know, still enjoying its apple juice a little bit, but it, it also seemed less excited. And, and that also made some sense. It's known as adaptation or habituation. It's why that new iPod is very excited. You know, makes you very excited for a week, and then after you know, a little while, it's just a thing in your pocket. Why the cashmere sweater you got for Hanukkah is thrilling, and then you wear it a couple times, and it's in the thing in your closet. Um, you know, we're naturally ungrateful. Uh, that's, that's just the way we're built. And, and you can trace this back down to how our dopamine neurons respond, that, that they very quickly adapt to rewards be it apple juice or the new sweater. But then Schultz found something very, very peculiar one day. So one day he's just walking into his lab and he opens up the door, this creaky old door, and as soon as he opens up the door, he hears the distinctive rat-a-tat-tat, you know, these, these machines that sound like a machine gun going off when dopamine neurons fire. And that at first is very confusing to him, because why would these neurons be so excited when he's just opening up the door? He hasn't given them squirts of apple juice. What are they so excited about? 
And then he starts to think, well, maybe they know that every time he opens up the door, that in a couple minutes the experiments will begin and they'll get apple juice. So he sets up a very clever protocol where he would ring a bell and give the monkeys a squirt of apple juice. And what he found is that after a couple trials, the neurons would fire whenever he rang the bell. And if he flashed a light before ringing a bell, they would fire whenever he flashed a light. And if he played a song before flashing a light before ringing a bell, they would fire whenever he played the song. In other words, they didn't care about the apple juice per se. They didn't care about the reward. What they were really interested in was the first event in time that predicted the reward. And, and you can extend this sequence indefinitely. That's why he calls them prediction neurons. That's what they really care about. And you can immediately understand how this cognitive talent is so useful. You know, the monkey that can first predict the arrival of juice or bananas or whatever it is monkeys want, they'll get there first. They'll maximize the reward. So, so having these cells in your brain, being able to find the patterns of events that lead to rewards, that predict rewards, is an incredibly useful skill. Then the question becomes, how do these little cells, this small circuit of dopamine neurons, how do they get so smart? You know, how do they actually know that the light predicts the bell, which predicts a squirt of apple juice? Here's where something called the prediction error signal comes in handy. So let's say you're feeling mischievous one day, and you've trained these monkeys, you know, play a song, flash the light, ring a bell, squirt of apple juice. What happens if you play the song, flash the light, ring the bell, and don't give them a squirt of apple juice. You don't give them the reward they've come to expect. Well, the first thing you find is that the monkeys get pissed off. Uh, the, the second thing you find is that the dopamine neurons release this very characteristic signal called a prediction error signal, which is basically their way of saying, you know, we thought we knew what was happening. We thought we understood this pattern, but it turns out we don't because there is no apple juice here. So it's, so it's actually a learning signal. It leads these neurons to recalculate, to rejigger their expectations and predictions. But the next time, they'll get it right. They're always trying to decrease the prediction error signal, the gap between what they expect and what actually happens. And this turns out to be a very, very powerful learning mechanism. It's an algorithm that's now being used to program cell phone towers, to program large banks of elevators. It tends to be a very efficient way to learn, and your brain is all about efficiency. Uh, the, the larger lesson, of course, is that it also illustrates that the way the brain learns at a very basic level is by making mistakes. That we learn how to get it right by studying what we got wrong, which is why one of my favorite quotes is a great quote by Niels Bohr, where he said, an expert is simply someone who has made all the possible mistakes there are to make in a very narrow field. Uh, and from the perspective of your dopamine neurons, that's actually the case, that, that you have to make lots of mistakes before these neurons can actually find the patterns that lead to apple juice. Now I think we know a bit about computational neuroscience, about prediction error signals. Now I think we can go back and, and begin to understand what was happening inside Mike O'Reilly's brain at 5.01 in the morning. So there he is. He's been, for six and a half weeks, he's been watching these same blips on his radar screen, you know, A6 fighter jets, take off, drop their bombs, go wet feet, same spatial path. So, so it's been drilled, this pattern of blips has been drilled into his brain. And the second day of the ground invasion, he's looking at his radar screen and he seems, what at first seems like an identical pattern of blips, just another pattern of blips appearing just off the coast, just off the Iraqi coast, going wet feet, heading back to the convoy. And yet some dopamine neuron somewhere in his midbrain says, uh-uh, this pattern of blips feels a little bit different. So it fires a prediction error signal. That signal is passed from synapse to synapse until it reaches the brain area called the anterior cingulate cortex, also known as the oh shit circuit. Um, <laughs> because it's, it's often associated with the perception of errors, contradictions, stuff like that. That brain area is then what leads to the generation of all this, these, these bodily signals, these bodily symptoms, the, you know, the clammy hands, the release of adrenaline, all these other things, these, this, the symptoms of fear, which led Mike O'Reilly to give the order to fire. And it all began with one dopamine neuron, one cell somewhere in the brain saying, this pattern of blips isn't quite what I've come to expect. Now, now I, th I think the larger point of the story, as I hinted at before, is, is that I think what our dopamine neurons really teach us is, is just how wise our emotions can be. That now, thanks to all sorts of nifty tools and very clever primate experiments, we can really drill down and, and begin to understand at a very detailed level, begin to see all the computation that takes place outside of awareness. Michael Riley couldn't begin to explain why he was scared. He had no idea why he was scared, but his fear was grounded in something very, very real. So when you've got experience in a domain, when you spend six weeks staring at a pattern of blips, when you've observed